Um, welcome everybody um, to this afternoon's session on feeding the world, what will be on Queensland's plate in 2050. Um, I'd like to welcome, introduce myself, um, my name is Bruce Turner, um, I'm your facilitator here for, the, for today's session. Um, I work in the, I'm responsible, I shouldn't say I work, I'm responsible for agriculture and food um, in the Department of Employment, Economic Development and Innovation in Queensland. And so it is my pleasure, because I'm passionate about food, um, to, to facilitate this session. I think just before I kick off and introduce our panellists, it is fair to say that um, I don't think there's any been a time in history nearly where there's been such a focus on food and all its various manifestations. We've just got to turn on the television at the moment and all we can seem to see is cooking shows. Um, but it's a more sophisticated proposition than that. And anybody who's actually tried to think about food and what food means, I think, does prompt a whole series of questions because food means so many different things to all of us. It is about sustaining life, it is about lifestyle, and it is about quality of life. And it has all sorts of other ramifications in terms of its impact on the environment um, and wealth distributions and a whole lot of other issues. But for me, I'd just like to put a little bit of context around today's discussion anyway. The United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization expects world population to exceed 9 billion people by 2050. 70% more food will be required to feed the world. What does this mean for Queensland, our risks and opportunities? And from a Queensland context, you'd probably be surprised to know that the food industry in Queensland is worth around $18 billion per annum. At least one in eight people in Queensland work within the food industry. Just a couple of interesting little facts to keep us at our deliberations here today. Um, the process I've got is we've got um, three speakers um, and quite different um, people, so it'll be interesting to see their, their perspective. Basically, the three speakers have d decided, um, I don't know whether it was unanimously, but they've agreed they're going to sit in the floor um, while each of them speaks so that they can actually hear and see the, the slideshows, and then they'll come up and join me for a, for a further discussion. Um, on that basis, I'd like to in introduce Michael Diocchio. Um, Michael leads the School of Animal Studies at the Queensland University. He works on animal production and reproduction, provides critical insights to global food security issues linked with climate change and population growth. Michael draws on extensive experience and expertise in both research and consulting in Australia and around the globe. In over 30 years of work in animal production, he has established international networks with the private sector, governments and other research organisations. Can you welcome Michael? Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for making your time, uh, or making time to come and listen to us and hope that um, you, you um, find it useful. And the useful bit, I think, will be the second part of this um, session. And I guess we'll just throw out some ideas and... Uh, and get some simulation and, and some thinking going. And I'm really pleased to see um, the next generation here um, as well. Great to see you and uh, expect some questions from you um, later. What I thought I might do, and you're not going to be able to see too many of these slides, so I try and um, say as much as I can. What I thought I might do is give a global perspective first and then drill down to areas close to Queensland and then to Queensland itself. So I thought it was important to give a bit of a, a global um, perspective. If I can just, um, I just need to move it. Hello. Can I put this on uh, on screen? No, no, I, I, I want this larger here. Can I have this larger here, please? Sorry about that. Can, I pick, can you do the whole screen for me? It is up on the No, no, here, I want it here. Uh, okay. I'm not normally this difficult, but... <laughs> Doesn't do it? No. Okay, all right. Okay, all right, thanks. All right. These are, I was trying to avoid having to use these, but here we go. Okay, um, the, the, the chair said that the um, global population is going to be about 9.2 um, billion people by 2050. I did a rough calculation. At um, about 11.15 this morning, the population was 6.891 billion or so. Um, since then and now, there have been 24,750 births in the world. There have been 7,000 deaths, which means that in the space of two and a half hours, there have been an additional 18,000 people um, in, in the world. 
Now, that's in two and a half hours, and you can do the sums yourself. I didn't have a calculator, so I couldn't do much more than that uh, this morning. But it puts in perspective the extraordinary rate of um, increase in the population. Now, it's not going to go on forever, obviously, but at the moment, it's still uh, increasing at an, at an extraordinary um, fast rate. Now, food security is not necessarily something new. If you look at, for those that can see the, um, the screens, uh, Reverend um, Thomas Mathis in 1798 said, hey, listen, the population is increasing pretty fast here, guys. There's no limit to population growth, theoretically, but there is a limit to um, feeding this sort of um, increase in, uh, in numbers. That was 200 years ago. So we fast forward now to uh, 1996, and the FAO made a statement trying to define what food security is. So it means that food security is when all people have access to the sort of food that they like, they can afford it, it's, it's within their sort of cultural um, domains, and it's, uh, and it's reasonably consistently available. So that's what the FAO defined as food security. And then a few years later, in 2000, a group got together and set up a set of um, Millennium Development Goals. And at the very top of that list was the goal that by 2015, the, the goal was to reduce hunger by about 15% relative to numbers in the 70s and so on. That was at the top of the Millennium Development Goals. Let's try and eradicate hunger and extreme poverty as well, because the two are, are, are very linked by 2015. What's happened since? Well, in 2009, the number of people in abject poverty and suffering from chronic undernutrition rose above 1 billion people. It's come down since then. It came down in 2010. In 2011, 2012, it's going to go back up. What's happening is the price of food follows the price of oil. Oil goes up, the price of food goes up. The people who are most disadvantaged from increases in global prices for grains or any food are not us. They are those who actually struggle to have food in the first place. And the really bizarre thing is that a lot of those people actually are farmers, smallholder farmers that produce food. So some of the people who suffer from chronic malnutrition, lack of food, are actually farmers who try to produce food in developing countries. The reason they suffer is that they don't have much money and they can't afford to supplement their diet with other types of foods that they don't produce. But let's not get carried away with the fact that the number of people came down. In April of this year, just last month, the crossover occurred. The amount of food being produced was less than the amount of food required globally. Global food stocks dropped from about 35%, which where they typically are, this is, this is the reserves of food globally, they're now around 20%. So we have a crossover, the amount of the demand versus supply, and the global stocks of food for crisis situations are at the lowest um, levels ever. For those of you that can see this screen, red means, or dark purple means abject poverty, red means poverty. There's a lot of the globe, unfortunately, too much of the globe that's covered by red and, and, and orange and so on. And when you get into the purple, it means that more than 35% of people suffer from extreme hunger and, and, and poverty. What's Australia's role, Queensland role, Queensland's role? The first message is Australia is not a breadbasket for the world. It never has been and never will be. And you hear people say, oh, we export 60% you know, of what we produce and so on and so forth. Yeah, sure. But that goes to 40 million people. What we export feeds 40 million people. Those 40 million people represent 3% of global world food movements. Those 40 million people can afford to pay the sort of price for the food that Australia produces. They are not the global poor. They are not the global hungry. And that when you project 40 million to 1.2 billion, it puts in perspective Australia is not the food, uh, food bowl of the world. So we feed 40 million people directly. What Australia's really important role is, has been in the past and will be in the future, is through education, training, knowledge and technology transfer. And that package helps to feed, conservatively, about 400 to 500 million people. 
Over 40 years, Australia has been a major player in developing capacity at the local farm, farm level. That's Australia's role in global food um, security. For those of you who can see this map, Queensland now. Queensland maps to a lot of places in the world that have chronic poverty, chronic hunger. The opportunity for Queensland, which Queensland's been sort of um, using for quite some time, is we have some of the best farmers in the world, most efficient farmers, we have some of the best scientists in the world. Our role will continue to be to engage with um, developing countries at the local smallholder level to pass on knowledge, technology and, and so on. Just coming back now to South Asia, or coming to South Asia, East Asia, Southeast Asia. At the moment, 3.7 billion people live close to Australia in the Asia region. That's more than half the global population. By 2050, 4.7 billion people will live close to Australia. More than half the global population in 2050. About 500 million or 700 million of those people will be able to afford and, and, and will be willing to pay the sort of price that Australian farmers expect to receive for the high quality, nutritious, healthy, safe food that Australian farmers produce. That's going to present some interesting sort of challenges. Will Australian farmers increasingly decide to sell food overseas to where what they do is respected in terms of the price that people pay? I think yes. What will that mean for us? I think it'll mean for Australians, including Queenslanders, less luxury in being able to sort of argue about a 5% increase per kilo in the price of oranges or the price of potatoes. So we'll have less availability and we'll have higher prices due to the sheer demand globally from people who will be wealthier than us and who'll be prepared to pay for a constant supply of Australian food. Now, you're not gonna be able to see this, so I'll just skip through those. Food is interlinked with climate change, biodiversity, water, and so on and so forth. It's a complex equation which provides some challenges for us. This picture here, the question here is food security in Queensland. Everyone in this room has probably not gone hungry in the last week or in the last year or ever in your life. I, I have in Italy. But if we're such a food secure state, then why do we have warehouses like this just up the road at Food Bank Queensland? where they recover food and each week feed 75,000 people. Why, do, why does food like this? This is a box of onions. They could have ended up in landfill. A box of potatoes could have ended up in landfill if the farmer hadn't put this, this food on his truck and driven it to Food Bank Queensland. This is the sort of stuff that, that's happening um, in Queensland at the moment. So we have, in Australia, Food Bank, Second Buy and Oz Harvest. And I did a back of the envelope calculation just recently with the food recovered from, by these three organisations. It's enough food to prepare 20 million meals every year. Just think about that. That food normally, or in the past, would have been thrown away. There's enough food recovered by three organisations, charity organisations in Australia, to prepare 20 million meals every year. So some questions. There are boundaries around how much food we can produce sustainably. The global demand for Australian food is going to increase, no question. It's going to be extraordinary. The global market will meet industry expectations on the price of food. That will impact domestically on the availability and price of food, and we will start to see substitution of Australian food with imported food. No doubt that in 2050, food will be more closely linked to health and well-being. It'll be food for life. Once we understand a bit more about our own DNA, once we, once we come to grips with the fact that food is so fundamental to health and well-being, preventing disease and even coping with the disease, uh, with disease we will start to be a bit more um, discriminating in terms of the foods that we, put in, that we put in our mouth. We will start to look to food that's produced ethically and sustainably and if there is one focus in terms of food, which links to food nut nutrition, it is women of childbearing age and young children. That, to me, will be the focus over the next 10 to 20 years. Women of childbearing age who are not nutritionally sound, not eating the right foods, not only impact on themselves, they impact on the child that they carry during a pregnancy. So there are children being born today in Brisbane and everywhere in Australia 
that are compromised at birth because their mothers have not eaten the right foods for a proper, a proper pregnancy. So at birth, these children are compromised. They're compromised for the rest of their life. Critical period, women are childbearing age. The other critical period is infants and, and children till about five or 10 years of age when you have extraordinary brain development, other physical development. If they're not nutritionally balanced, if they don't have proper food during that window in life, you can't fix it later. There are windows where things develop, tissues develop. If you don't get the food right in infants and young children, you unfortunately have compromised those people for life. So that's sort of throwing up some thoughts and we'll look forward to the session on uh, your questions. Thanks. Good. Thanks very much, Michael. Yes, and there was a lot of thought-provoking um, issues in there, and um, particularly I, I like the concept that we really shouldn't be maybe exporting food, but really we probably should be exporting our brains. Um, something to dwell on. Um, next speaker is Dan Galligan. Um, Dan joined the, the team at Queensland Farmers Federation, who is one of the key um, agri-political organisations in Queensland, in January 2009. Dan was previously the policy manager for Cotton Australia and he has worked in advocacy roles in Queensland and New South Wales as well as holding grower services and management positions. So I think Dan is the one who sort of represents the people who um, get the mud underneath the fingernails. So welcome to the podium, Dan. Good afternoon, everyone, and um, likewise with Michael, thanks for joining us. Uh, it's already turning out to be an interesting discussion, having listened to Michael's presentation and a few themes that will come out. What I'm going to do in my couple of minutes of introduction before we get into the discussion is really just try and frame up the perspective from the farmer's point of view, so it's quite a domestic story rather than the international story we've just heard, and I guess the, uh, discuss the environment in which farmers are making decisions about the type of food, and in our context, food and fibre they're growing, and then hopefully after that we can actually talk about the future a little bit more. I'll even have to squint. Uh, essentially, the main, main point I want to make in about nine or ten minutes is that farmers are actually responding to a system. They don't drive the system. Farmers operate in a demand-constrained world, and that means that basically uh, it's a pretty simple equation for me. We're getting more people on the planet, more people in Brisbane, more people in Queensland. Every time we have more people, they all want a house. Every time we build a house, we lose a little bit more soil there's a little bit more land, all those people need food, more food we produce, we've got less land to do it on and we need more water to do it and we're generating more waste. From a farmer's perspective, that means we need to do more with less land and less water. Simple as that. Now, it's an interesting topic to talk about whether or not it's just all about increasing yields, but the equation is very simple. We're losing water and we're losing land and we're asking more of each in terms of what we generate from them. As a very simple stat, we've lost about 10% of our farming land in the last 10 years. A lot of that might be through drought, but we've lost about 20% in the last 40 years. So we're losing land to houses, to other sorts of industries all the time. In Queensland, out of interest, most of the cropping production comes off about 2% of our land in Queensland. It's only 2%, so it's a very small area, but we produce the food that we need. In terms of uh, the choices that farmers make in terms of the crops they grow, I think there's a couple of things that are worth pointing out. Uh, I don't know about you, but I buy most of my groceries either from the local markets at Rockley or from the supermarket, but it's probably easily 70% comes from my supermarket, and generally that's the case for everybody. Supermarkets are a real driver in, in uh, pushing people towards what they buy. Uh, certainly, consumers have a lot of choice in terms of what they can do, but consumers are very, very strongly led by the retailers. For that reason, consumers have a real and present themselves as a real dichotomy of choice. On one hand, much like many people in the room, I really want to buy ethically produced, sustainably produced products, whether it's organic chickens or um, phosphate free um, um, uh, washing powder, doesn't matter. On one hand, you want to do that. But like others, I might sneak down to the local Maccas for a sneaky cheeseburger on a Friday night as well. And consumers are like that. They want one hand, they want something that's uh, at one end of the spectrum, but on the other hand, they want um, very cheap, very um, uh, easy food to obtain. Uh, what does that mean to a farmer? What sort of food do they produce and how do they make those decisions? It's a tricky bit. 
but the first thing a farmer needs to do, just like any business, is actually remain economically viable. So this is the balancing act. What market do I produce for that will maintain my economic viability, but also I'm responding to a consumer or a retailer in this instance in terms of making sure that viability is, is there. So for me, I want to leave you with this thought out of my 10 minutes. Farmers are actually responding to a system. They're not driving the system. They produce to a desire to be both economically viable and to meet a market. And that tells us what things we need to do in terms of changing the farming systems that we can manage. And we manage them pretty well in Queensland, and in fact nationally we do. But if we want to change the types of food we produce, if we want to change the types of fibre we produce, then we need to drive that system and present it as being economically viable and the farming system will respond. I'm just going to tick off a few issues there. I've, I've pointed out the demand squeeze from a land water expertise, which Michael's mentioned in a policy perspective, and I'm just going to go through a few of those and present them more as opportunities. Uh, we've already had, I think, a very good introduction to my view on expertise. We actually have excellent farm, globally recognised as excellent farmers in Queensland and, and in Australia, but I'll focus on Queensland. Uh, the problem is we're losing them. Again, we've, lo we've lost about 15% of our farmers in the last 15 years as well. So the numbers of people farming are, are dwindling. The average age of a farmer in Australia is a nudge under 60. So we've got to find more people entering into the farming uh, environment as a profession, and they've got to come from a greater diversity of backgrounds. Then we've got to take the knowledge that's gained in Australia, and certainly we need to export it. Uh, certainly we need to, to work with um, our trading partners on the types of things we do in Australia. But I'd also argue that it's critical that we still need to innovate in the Australian farming system, because innovation is actually what's got us here. And that's another point I'd leave you with. Innovation and the adoption of technology costs money. A farmer invests in that adoption of technology or a new farming system, say it's an organic farming system, it's not necessarily high tech when I say technology, but it costs money and someone has to pay. And if someone can't pay, the farmer goes broke and we've lost another one. So innovation and successful farming systems cost money. So we need to maintain that innovation in Australia if we're to do what Michael just correctly said, and that's actually export that expertise as well. Secondly, we need to look at what constrains the farming system in terms of land and we need to encourage diversity in our farming systems. And often, there isn't the environment to do that. At the moment, our horticultural industries, which only makes up about 8% of all farming businesses in Australia, but that's all that fruit and veggie, the stuff we've got on the table, it produces all of what we consume. But uh, our horticultural systems are fairly simple. There's no innovation, there's no no, not necessarily any driver to encourage a glasshouse system within a horticultural system. It's very difficult from a planning context to actually diversify a farming system in many local in government environments. And you know why? Because the consumer doesn't want them to. Consumers don't necessarily like too much innovation in their backyard. They'd like to buy it in the product, but they don't necessarily like it close to them in a farming system. So we've got to ask ourselves some questions about what we want from our food. We also need to look at how we buy food. And as I mentioned about supermarkets, we need to encourage people to buy food from different environments, from local markets, from strip shopping malls that have really gone out of fashion, but they're local green grocers. And the reason for that is because that is an element of cutting down on waste and marketing products that at the moment farmers are driven to the waste stream or, again, as we've heard, systems like food bank. But that, that uh, waste is often becoming from a retailer driving for a certain market spectrum in the belief that that's all consumers will accept. I don't think that's all that consumers will accept, but we need to drive that system. A couple of other opportunities in terms of removing scarcity. Water is simple, but the message is clear. It's reuse and recycle. Uh, irrigation is going to take, takes a key role in making a viable farming system and producing an efficient farming system. That means we need to recycle water. I can tell you now, uh, recycling water from uh, tertiary treated effluent plants, from sewage systems, from what people you and I have done, using that water to farm, almost impossible. And that's because we won't let it happen. It's because society hasn't actually come to grips with the idea, a very simple idea, of recycling treated uh, sewage water to be able to use on a farm. Farmers want to do it because it cuts down on water use. 
but we haven't dealt with it as a, as a society yet, and we need to. So recycling in the farming system is very important. There's lots of things we need to do in terms of a, of a public to accept change, in terms of driving that innovation. I've mentioned generating new farmers, new ways of looking at farmers, encouraging uh, people in towns to actually have vegetable gardens. Again, there's a constraint in the system. As we run out of places to build houses, we go into smaller lot holdings, and then we uh, have trouble putting the vegetable garden in the backyard of the apartment complex. But there's lots of green space in Queensland, and we haven't actually encouraged community vegetable gardens. Now, I represent the commercial farming industry, and I'll tell you right now, it doesn't matter how many vegetable gardens you get, how many community gardens you build, you're not going to produce enough food. You're still going to need farmers but it's an important cultural shift in recognising the importance of food, the value of that food, the complexity of that food, the seasonality of that food, so that needs to be part of the growth of the society to value all those things. And finally, in terms of innovation, we're going to have to come to grips with that technology that includes the use of biotechnology, genetic modification, and that's innovation in the farming system. But that's about farmers bringing the community along on the path of what choice they have and their ability to change their farming system in order to become uh, increasingly viable. And viability means in terms of producing their primary product, food in this instance, and also managing the landscape. And that's why I put up there the importance of society valuing stewardship. And that's really about balancing economic viability, food production, and environmental stewardship. And at the moment, we only value about a third of that equation. Unless we deal with that, we're not going to end up with viable producers who are looking to produce ethically sustained food, sustainable food, because it'll be uneconomical in the long, front, long run. So there's a few challenges more about what we need to do, not necessarily just about farmers, but there's a whole host of opportunities. In terms of the food, the question I was actually asked, what's on the plate in 2050? Well, it's going to be food, as my wife said. Is it all going to be tablets like it was in the Jetsons? No. You look backwards, 50 years ago it was food. It still will be food. I support a lot of the comments Michael's made. I think there'll be a greater diversity of food. It'll be more nutritionally linked. There's a fair chance it'll probably have a less of a, co a, um, a component from protein. Uh, there'll be more imported food. Uh, we'll have to look at bringing food from other states, which is sometimes more difficult than you can, you can um, often imagine how many laws there are in place about moving food between the states of Australia, but you'd be shocked, let me tell you. Uh, but we need to break this demand uh, push cycle for the farming system and the driver for growth against productivity, firstly cutting down waste and encouraging innovation and diversity in a farming system that isn't purely led by economic viability, which means diversifying what economic viability means for farmers. I'll leave you with those thoughts and look forward to a chat. Thank you. Good, thanks very much, Dan. Um, that, was, that was very most interesting, and a couple of little observations that came out of that for me was something about valuing and understanding food. And I think, Dan, you nearly sort of put a bit of a question there to us in terms of should we be expanding farming lands in Queensland? But I'll leave that there. Um, our next speaker is um, Howard Parry Husbands, um, with qualifications in geography, I gather. Um, but then again, I then and that, that you're a terrible surfer, and I didn't know whether that was because you actually couldn't find the surf, but anyway, we'll leave it at that. But Harry, Howard is um, very much involved in consumers. Um, he runs his own business called Pollinate, and helping pe pe businesses put people first in the marketing process. And he's passionate about the pursuit of sustainability, apparently a proud father and a terrible surfer, as I alluded to. So welcome, Howard. Um, Michael, I think, took us on an interesting journey around the world there, and um, if I could just pick up on a point from Michael, which is that the world's poorest people, those most likely to starve, are indeed farmers. Um, Dan brought it closer to home to Queensland, and a uh, very pithy point, farmers respond to demand. Um, I'm going to talk today about consumers. That's all of us, that's uh, everybody, in fact, is a consumer. It's an economic term, of course, and uh, apparently we drive demand. So um, we've heard about the demand side of the equation. Let's talk about the consumer side of the equation. Um, when I walked in today, I was met by a lady downstairs called Trisha. I don't know if she's here. Thank you, Trisha. You were very welcoming. And uh, Trisha told me about her grandmother, Vera Craddock, who was born in 1888. 
Uh, Vera died in 1972, and um, Vera uh, witnessed the first street lamps going into um, Melbourne. They were gas lamps at the time. And um, she died just shortly after um, a man walked on the moon. And uh, apparently the wise words of Vera, um, which I will uh, revisit at the end of this lecture, were that people will starve from too much choice. I think that's a very interesting statement from someone, well, she's been dead now, bless her, for 40 years, and I never met her. Um, but I really want to tackle today the issue of demand and supply, or supply and demand, and effectively um, present you with the paradox that our entire market system is effectively broken. Uh, it is actually not as simple, with the greatest of respect, Dan, to say um, it's a demand-led equation, uh, nor is it a supply-led equation. The equation simply doesn't add up anymore and must change. Let's find out exactly why. Um, in 2050, there's a distinct possibility that on Queensland's plate, on the right-hand side, is absolutely nothing. Uh, there's also, obviously, a distinct possibility that we still have a very large bag of groceries, as you see on the left-hand side in this slide. So um, I'll, I'll put the question to us here. Um, re realistically, 40 years from now, we may have absolutely nothing, uh, or we may have a surfeit of food as we currently enjoy. I do concur with Dan's point, though. We're certainly uh, wasting far too much at the moment. What are the issues that are confronting us in this room? What are the issues confronting Queenslanders? Well, they're the same issues that confront um, most of the world, certainly the developed world. Uh, in, in the top left is a, um, a picture of drought. We'll just Google drought in Australia. There's pages and pages and pages and pages of drought in Australia. It will come back. It is inevitable. Um, it obviously seriously limits our food production. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think you move from cotton because it's even worse than that, isn't it? But anyway. Uh, on the right-hand side is a fat fella. Um, an awful lot of us are fat. I think we're the uh, second fattest place now in the world after Canada or the US. Um, not a good statistic. I believe a quarter of Australians are now uh, clinically obese and another quarter are overweight. That makes half of us a little pudgy. Mm. That's a rather significant issue. The bottom left graph is um, the uh, phosphorus curve. Um, uh, most of Australia, I'm not a scientist, but I believe that most of Australia's food production relies on the import of fertiliser. Uh, phosphorus is a key input to fertiliser and it's uh, running out. Um, of course, the only issue there is they'll find more phosphorus, they'll find clever things to do. But the price of food will go up. And the bottom right hand, uh, well, that's a busy maternity ward in Brazil. The bottom line is there's lots of us being born, and as Thomas Mouth has pointed out, it's unsustainable um, to have lots more people being born because we, um, we produce rather faster than food does. Why have I put that chart up? Well, actually, obesity and climate change, ladies and gentlemen, are failures of markets. This is a quote from a British um, policy um, organisation. Obesity and climate change are two huge market failures, okay? They are a failure of uh, the economic system. The economic system has been making money for a rather long time. The little graph in the corner there shows, effectively, uh, that's Queensland's economy, and as you can see, it's been going up. It's been going up for a very jolly long time, and we're doing very well. The problem with um, economics is it has this thing called externalities. So things that have no value in the economic system are just called externalities, and we just ignore them. Uh, two fundamental externalities are pollution on the one hand, which is uh, currently considered to be driving climate change, which of course causes um, more severe weather systems which directly affect food production. Uh, the other externality that's currently not considered by the economic system is the cost of health from all of us eating too much of the wrong food. Uh, that's currently so out of kilter that there's not a single developed country in the world that can actually afford its own health care bill. So we've got this rather large problem. We have economic growth at the moment in Queensland and indeed in Australia at the expense of our personal health and indeed at the expense of the health of the environment. So the law of supply and demand is the issue. How on earth can we make people, and that's all of us, make better choices about what we buy to reduce demand for, well, basically crap? Uh, all that stuff we're buying that is um, not very good or not good enough uh, is causing a significant burden on our health, on our happiness, on our environment and on our tax. Let's not kid ourselves, the single biggest driver of unhappiness is health. It would be fair to say one of the other major drivers of unhappiness is a very poor environment. Mm. And of course, if we can't fix those, we just have to raise the tax hike. And apparently, that's not very popular either. So, can people actually be an agent for change? Um, you might be interested to know that a number of governments around the world are discussing whether people actually have any role to play whatsoever. Dan talked about demand and supply. Uh, the British government is currently discussing whether, frankly, it's all about legislation. Just pass laws, don't allow people to eat as much rubbish, and um, then they'll change their behaviour, possibly. Um, I'm a, a consumer market researcher, so I think people matter. Um, the Australian economy, out of interest, is pretty much built on what people buy and sell. This is ABS data. Um, about two-thirds of the entire Australian economy is, is basically just consumption, what everybody in this room buys and sells every week. 
So the mining sector, tiny by comparison to um, just consumption. The agricultural sector, tiny by comparison to consumption. Most developed economies are basically bought on re uh, built on retail, what people buy and sell. Um, so, okay, people might have a role to play, but do they actually care about things like the environment? Uh, less than they um, have in the last four or five years. The chart here just shows data. The arrow makes it easy. Concern for the environment is going down and has been since I've been collecting data in 2007. Okay, so people are a little less concerned. They probably think things are being done. There's certainly not a drought on anymore, but actually most Australians are still either extremely or very concerned. The issue um, is, is that they're not actually doing anything about it. There's no correlation, and nor is there globally, between concern for the environment and change in behaviour. That's a problem, isn't it? That's a paradox. If I'm worried about something, or I particularly want something, in, in most marketing situations, I just go and do something about it. Fancy chocolate? Buy chocolate. That's pretty much how we react. The entire world's economic system is built on that basis. The problem with food security and with climate change is that simply doesn't work. Um, people actually don't uh, have an attitude, issue, anxiety or concern and uh, adopt behaviours to address them. That's why we have a chronic obesity crisis and that's why we have things like climate change. Um, this this data is quite simple. We just ask people whether they feel they can make a difference. Uh, they do. Uh, pretty much if you ask three people, um, do you think you can make a difference to the environment? Who do you think... Um, um, can make a di difference. One, one will say the government, one will say people, and the other person will choose from all the other options like industry or whatever. E effectively, people see themselves as able to make a difference. They want to be empowered. I'm just going to introduce a paradox for you because it is an ideas festival. This may um, be a little bit of a challenge. Um, the more informed people become about the issues around climate change, for instance, or let's call them broadly speaking green issues, food security would be another one, the less likely they are to become green consumers or conscious consumers. Does that make sense? The more you know about something, typically, the, the more likely you are to make, well, let's say, a considered decision. Unfortunately, the more you know about climate change, the less likely you are to become a green consumer. That's rather paradoxical, isn't it? The reason is that the more you know about climate change, the more you realise the entire system is incredibly complex and related, the more you are just likely to go, I'm just going to buy less. You become less of a consumer, which may actually be just as beneficial in the long run. But from a marketing perspective, it creates a paradox, doesn't it? How on earth do we change behaviours with marketing when the more we educate people, the less they respond to marketing? It's a problem. Luckily, academics um, who are much cleverer than I have been working on this for a long time. It's pretty simple. If you want to change behaviour about macro things like environment change or, or food security, you make it easy to do and you make sure that it obviously makes a difference. Uh, that's the entire Australian population, or about a thousand odd people that we sampled, and they're all the things you can do in Australia um, that would potentially have an impact on um, creating a better environment. Um, the vertical axis is how easy is it. If it's at the top, it's easy. If, if it's at the bottom, it's hard. The left to right axis is it d makes a difference or not. On the left hand side, it would be it makes no difference. On the right hand side, it would be it makes a big difference. The size of the bubble is the percentage of the Australian population who bothered to do this stuff. It's a fairly simple correlation. If it's really easy to do, they're more likely to do it. You'll see bigger bubbles at the top. And if it's perceived to make a difference to the environment, they're more likely to do it. You'll see a cluster of big bubbles in the top right-hand corner. The thing people are least likely to do is to be a vegetarian. So all those people who like eating meat, there's a lot of you. Um, the things that people are most likely to do is things like uh, turn the lights off and do lots of recycling. We have the highest rate of recycling, I believe, in the world, if not the second highest. So basically, make it easy, uh, make it obviously going to make a tangible difference. Uh, you've heard these statistics already. Um, it's about $657 of waste per household a year. Um, I've, I've always find it incredible as a market researcher how much policies and things from governments and whatever are seen as terribly unpopular and it wastes my money and people actually waste a colossal amount of their money consciously every single day. But let me just leave you with um, the uh, ghost of Vera Craddock. Do you remember her from the beginning, 1888? people will starve from too much choice. Barry Schwartz uh, is a US academic, and about uh, 20 odd years ago, he came up with this fabulous um, uh, thesis, the paradox of choice. Uh, Barry Schwartz basically did loads and loads of research. He's a consumer psychologist, and he came up with an interesting finding. Too much choice makes it hard for people to choose at all. And too much choice also makes many of us very unhappy with the choices we eventually make. In fact, too much choice is quite simply an influence on unhappiness in society. So I'm going to ask the question of the whole room today, do we simply have too much freedom of choice? Have we got so much freedom that we've actually made ourselves unhappy? 
Many of us clearly choose irresponsibly. I refer to the gentleman in the bottom right-hand corner and his waistline. The market system, ladies and gentlemen, needs to accept greater responsibility for the consequences of our actions. It is simply not good enough now to blame producers, farmers, governments. It, it's all of our responsibility. We have to accept that we need higher taxes on food, fat food, or maybe on being fat. Um, we need to accept that the economic system needs to include the cost of pollution within the production method, whether we like it or not. Uh, we need to consider more local food, community gardens, and perhaps having less choices out there on the supermarket shelves. Most of it simply isn't good for us anyway. Sustaining food on our plate, ladies and gentlemen, means taking responsibility for the choices that we're making. And it's a user pays model because we live in capitalist society. I have no problem with that. We live within that paradigm. We need to have better choices and lower cost for those better choices. So in summary, give people less choice. Take the worst of everything off the market. Make positive choices easy and make positive choices deliver a clear benefit. All of us need to take responsibility for the consequences of our actions, both as producers and consumers. Well, thanks very much, Howard. Or should I be thanking Vera for that presentation? <laughs> um, OK, well, I'd like to um, invite the, the, the panellists um, to come up and um, join me for the final remainder of um, the 20 minutes. Um, but just as they're settling in, I didn't have lunch today. So I've just brought on, up onto the table, or onto my table here, what I'd actually planned to have for lunch today. Um, my daughter describes me as a gentleman of a certain age, um, and so that I'm still very wedded to the notion that I should be able to go down to the pub on a Friday afternoon and, and have my counter lunch. And this is what I have before me. Now, within that, on that plate, it's quite an interesting array of food. And um, I picture most of you wouldn't even know where it comes from. But I'd just like, before we sort of turn to our panellists, it's just to think about each of those items on the plate and how and where th they might have come to this particular position. Beef, we're pretty safe on. We know it's probably come from Queensland somewhere. We are the la one of the largest exporters of beef in the world, and we certainly de derive a lot of jobs and input jobs and economic wealth from our beef production. These little things come from Vietnam. Chips, you wouldn't have a clue where they came from. And you wouldn't have a clue where they've, what they've been cooked in and in what, from what oils. Salad, probably a fair chance that it's probably come from within, oh, well, it could have come from Perth, could have come from Hobart, could have come from Brisbane, depending on the season, or it probably even could have come from overseas if um, during the summer months. And then we've got a bit of cake there. A lot of ingredients, a lot of processing. And then I've got my bottle of Coke. I would have rather have had a beer, but I'm told that I'm going to have Coke. Um, but again, just think about that Coke and, ha and what, what are the constituent parts of that Coke. And so the question I'm really going to pose to my, my panellists, and really goes back to introductory remarks, what am I going to be eating in 2050 and what's wrong with this? Michael. How do you work this? Are you, yep. um, you probably won't be eating that in 2050, I don't think. Because <laughs> um, hopefully by then you would have understood that, you, well, you don't need that much. <laughs> you probably <laughs> under, and need a, a quarter of that. And I, I think that um, you'd be more conscious of um, the sort of things you were putting in your mouth in terms of where they were from. You'd be looking at that plate and, and looking to see that the, the food was ethically produced, uh, you'd be looking for that label, and, and so you'd be going around your plate and you'd say how much water, how much energy, how much human, human, human effort, and so on and so forth. So I think that it almost you'd have different little barcodes, or each of which you can sort of shine a little gadget on and say, okay, it took two litres to produce this, and so on and so forth. I think what I'm, the message is, we'll be much more conscious of, of, of the effort that goes into producing um, the food that's put in front of us. Dan, from a farmer's perspective, what? Uh, I'd, uh, only because it should be made, I'd, I'd like to make the point in 2050 as well that uh, it's the volume of food that we consume is ridiculous. You know, and who's ever been on a diet? I've had another crack at it this year and lost quite a few kilos. Uh, and the first thing you do if you're actually serious about diet is work out how many calories you actually need to 
consume versus how many you burn. And the first and easiest way of doing that is stop trying to put so much into your gob, really, and we all eat too much. But where's all that waste going? Uh, from, a, from a farmer's perspective, the brief point I'd make is to allow consumers to make a choice, uh, they need to know where the products are coming from. And there's some amazing statistics about what consumers have done in terms of choosing their purchase uh, decisions related to seafood products since we've had good product uh, country of origin labelling happening. Uh, people are making a choice. Uh, and the other observation is how extraordinary it is that somehow or another we've got a surf and turf on a plate here that clearly has come from all parts of the country and parts of the globe uh, and it's been able to be put on the plate for, I don't know, maybe $15 or something like that and people are buying it. So what does that say about how we're valuing and costing out and what people are pre prepared to pay for um, produce? Good, thanks very much, Dad. Howard, from a consumer's perspective, is... Um, I'm going to mention Vera again. I mean, when Vera was born in 1888, she was probably at the tail end of, of an epoch when being fat was a sign of wealth. Um, we have a fabulously ironic uh, situation a century on where being skinny and um, toned within an inch of your life and having a baby and six weeks later turning out in a, in a bikini and looking wonderful is a sign of fabulous wealth. Um, what, what we've actually done in, in Queensland and much of the developed world is we've, we've, we've just quite happily allowed the poorest segment of our society to, sh to shoulder the largest burden in terms of... Um, uh, ill health. Um, I, I, I would like to think that in 2050 the poorest people in Queensland will not still be eating plates of deep fried crap like that. Uh, but I think unless we change the system rather dramatically, it's, it's reasonably likely. It is a market-based system. The, the reality is, unless we take responsibility as a total society for the fact that we've allowed uh, wealthy people to, to have more and better choices and access um, better choices, but we've effectively subsidised that choice by allowing the poorest segments of society to live off a, a terrible diet. Um, yeah, I, I'll be an optimist. In 2050, portions will be smaller, it'll be less deep fried, and if it comes from the pub, as you rightly said, and people are eating there, they're more likely to be a lower socio-economic uh, variable, they'll hopefully be willingly choosing a salad. Um, but we need a, a fundamental change in, in society for that to happen first. Well, how's that going to occur? Um, well, my biggest gripe really in, in Australia, to be perfectly honest, is, is and I, I welcome the presence of the younger generation here, the first thing we need to do is you need to take responsibility. Um, I, I have a, an issue every time I listen to talk back radio, or, or politicians for that matter, because I'm, I'm a little bit fed up with hearing about the, the uh, issues but not being guided towards uh, an explanation. We all of us have a responsibility to ourselves to take responsibility for understanding what's going on and the consequences of what's going on. And as a society, I think, especially in Australia, um, we're too busy debating and getting angry about issues and, and instead of just addressing the reality of, well, OK, let, let's just consider what we should do. A simple example. Um, let's take climate change. Whether you're a climate sceptic or not, to me, is fairly irrelevant. What is the risk if you're wrong? If you're a climate sceptic and you're wrong, OK, what's the risk of all these climate mitigation measures? The world's less polluted. That doesn't seem to be a terribly bad risk. Uh, let's say you're really worried about the climate and you put climate mitigation measures in and you're wrong. What, what's the risk then? Well, the risk is you've wasted loads of money and the world's less polluted. I, I really don't see what the upshot of the problem is. Making the world less polluted seems like a fairly sensible thing to do. I would suggest we apply the, the same philosophy to things like obesity. But it comes down to each and every one of us actually not getting angry and just railing and, and shouting at the television um, or talk back radio, but, but, but taking some time and effort to invest in actually understanding the issues. Um, and perhaps deciding that, yes, we do all need to take a bit more responsibility, waste less, uh, choose more carefully, um, and become less emotional about this and, and recognise that we're, we're really being terribly indulgent to ourselves. Good, thanks. Uh, Michael, I'm not quite sure whether we want to export my plate to Asia at the moment, but I was interested in your comments about education and technology transfer. Um, is Queensland really doing enough in that space? Yeah, I mean... Uh, Australia engages probably over 100, oh, sorry, Queensland <laughs> engages with probably over 100 countries. Um, history goes back 40, 50 years um, through programs supported by ACR, the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research, uh, AusAid, um, the Crawford Fund and the Queensland Government itself. Um, Queensland has been extremely active, probably in part because for those that might have seen my map, Queensland has a range of environments from sort of extensive rangelands, wet tropics, dry subtropics, mm. so on and so forth, across the state, which 
map to the range of environments where we have developing countries and, 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 and poorer communities that are receiving sort of national and international support. So Australia has the expertise not only amongst farmers who grow food in those different regions, but also scientists who try and work with farmers in those different regions. And, and we have a real responsibility, I think, given that Queensland, more than the rest of Australia, does map to parts of the world, including Sub-Saharan Africa, including South Asia and Southeast Asia, and also Oceania to, the, to, the, to, our, to our right or to our east that we forget about a lot. Um, we've got a lot to do, or can do and will do, I think, in terms of helping the, the real needy in the world, and, and these are the people in abject poverty and with chronic malnutrition. If I could, if I could just build on that, I, th I think it's a really good opportunity to, to link let's say production here, farmers, and the expertise we have in Australia with consumers. I would like to be incredibly proud of taking a leadership role with alleviating global poverty through uh, taking the stuff we do very well here, farming, in, in you know, semi-arid and um, subtropical zones, to the rest of the world that is in most acute need. I, I don't see that we're currently taking a leadership role in that sense, and that seems to me to be a, a real shocking waste of an opportunity for Australia. I think there's a core tenet towards taking responsibility, which is you actually have to stand up and, and take leadership. And, uh, and that, to me, would be one of the uh, key things that would unite and galvanise people of, say, Queensland. It's Queensland that's helping to solve a global problem because we're the best people at it. That would seem to me to be a, a, a fantastic opportunity. Dan, do you want to comment? <laughs> well, I, well, I was going to put you on the spot a bit. I mean, with no offence to the brand. <laughs> But we seem to be, we seem to be talking, and it comes back a bit about that choices, and I suppose in many ways in, in Queensland we have a large, well, we don't, we don't have a large number of, we have a lot more farmers than we do manufacturers and marketers and, and retailers. So I suppose the question I was really wanting to place on you, what do you see in terms of the future in terms of Queensland farming with that tension between we really only have three or four retailers, we really probably only have two or three big large processes and how is that going to shape the market for food and ad addressing that issues that we've all spoken about from a health and, and waste point of view. Now I wish I'd made a comment because your question was much harder than the previous one but uh, there's, there's clearly uh, going to be a lot more consolidation in farming numbers and, and that's a sort of progressive thing so when I, I point out that we're, the numbers of farmers are reducing that's not necessarily um, a dire warning, it's just a statement of fact. And I think if there's anything that's missing is that we are still fairly simple structurally in the way we view farming as separate from food production, food processing, food consumption. I um, have to say, most, uh, most cane producers, of which there is a lot in Queensland, wouldn't see themselves as necessarily being attached to that bottle of Coke if the product they're producing a fair bit of it is in there, I can tell you that. Uh, and that's a real problem. We need to actually shorten the supply chain, as we call it, and engage the food system from production to consumption much more. And there's a lot of talk going on about that. It's very difficult. But the numbers of players, Bruce is exactly right, the numbers of players are very limited at the retail end and the food processing end in Queensland and very extremely vast in terms of the numbers of producers. Numbers of producers will consolidate I think we need to build that, cons that consolidation needs to be built on a foundation of increasing expertise. That's, I guess, my point. And the biggest worry is bringing new blood into the, into the farming system rather than necessarily worrying too much about people getting old because we've never been able to stop that too well anyway. Good, good thanks. Michael, did you have a comment on that at all? Oh, I mean, in terms of bringing um, new, new people into farming, the way that I view it is I think there's an extraordinary opportunity to sell good Australian food to global markets for prices that they will pay producers for producing it. That's one of my messages. Go out to 2050, and, and I, went, I went through the numbers before, I think increasingly um, producers of food in Australia will be looking to sell their food into markets in, in Asia. Uh, that'll pay the price that producers want. That's the, um, so the long term, the, the, the bizarre thing is that for producers of food, for farmers in Australia, looking out 30 or 40 years, is, 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 is a positive scenario. It's a question of how they position themselves for markets that unquestionably are going to be there. So I think the message is a positive. 
and, and that's what young people need to be told. The question is, for the rest of us here, <laughs> access to food and price, I think it's going to impact on us. So there are two issues. For the farming community, I think the, the long-term projection out of 2050 is a positive one from a business perspective. For us, well, we've got to learn to live with it. I actually had a question to Dan to build on that. Dan, do you, do you see, you mentioned community gardens, and, and you said it really won't make an IOT different to total production. Well, how much broccoli we grow in community gardens, we'll still need farms that grow large scale broccoli. I, I, I get that. W what do you see the role of community gardens as in terms of changing the system? I should say I'm a big fan of community gardens, by the way. So. Uh, I think uh, the point I was just trying to make is that while it doesn't fill a gap in production, it brings the consumer closer to the production system. And one of the issues, I was just looking at the apples on the table, we talked about waste. One of the issues is just ensuring consumers reduce waste by also being appreciative of how complex it is to actually produce a product in a very narrow window of um, quality that many, producers, many consumers actually want when they go to a supermarket. Uh, a market garden just brings more people into the family of understanding the difficulties, but also appreciating the seasonality of produce so that they know when they're going to consume it. If it's in season, it's going to travel less and it's probably going to be fresher and better for you anyway, but it also means it's, cost, it's, it's less energy to produce, so it's a, it's a better all-round system. So it's about engaging the community in the broader complexity of farming and um, it won't hurt to reduce the amount of waste as well. I agree. My, my thoughts on it, it's interesting to hear it from a farming federation expert because I, I think the more that we understand the amount of effort that goes into food production, the less likely we are to, to waste it uh, in a rather willy-nilly fashion. And I think the best way to do that, you know, for all of us who've actually tried to grow something to eat it, and then the possum eats it one day before you harvest it, uh, it, it makes us all realise quite how much effort goes into making sure that a strawberry, you know, a nice little punnet, makes its way to our plate eventually. And so I, I think that what we need is societal shift uh, to change attitudes and understanding, and that'll drive more responsibility, as well as a production shift. Um, but I think the two need to happen in concert. Michael, so if I can just come in quickly, I mean, we have no respect for food, which is why we throw away $5 billion worth. I don't have the data for Queensland, but in Victoria, 2.2 million tonnes of food goes to the dump, actually goes to the dump every year. That food contains in virtual water what was required to produce that food and what's actually contained in the food, because 90% you know, of what's on the table is water. That food, 2.2 million tonnes in Victoria that goes to the dump, there's enough virtual water there for Sydney and Melbourne combined for 12 months. And yet we argue, and we have a debate in Australia about water scarcity and so on, and yet we're in Victoria alone, they're sending enough water for Sydney and Melbourne for one year to the dump. It's bizarre. We, it, it's simply not in the Australian psyche. The value of food is simply not in our psyche because we have, as we were told, we have too much, we don't respect it. Well, thanks. Thanks very much, Michael. And I think that might be actually an opportune time to, to um, call this afternoon's session um, close because I'm actually looking at my plate. And I'm looking at my plate and the only thing that's going to survive is the bottle of Coke. <laughs> and the rest will be dumped. Um, and that says something, made some, something about us too. Um, so um, I would like you to thank our panellists here today, um, Michael, Dan and, and Howard. And I hope that you've um, got your thought juices um, bubbling away there about food. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.